saxophone originally from the classic material, from a French classic material, uh, the Jacques Hébert 
Tina de Camera and, and many different uh, pieces of French uh, saxophone music. So my warm-up routine and the way I practice is related to classical uh, techniques that I learned when I was beginning to play. So my way, at, my way of playing has always been a combination of classical technique, physical technique, and then listening and playing with other people. While I was beginning to play, I was studying classical saxophone with my teacher, and then I started to listen to jazz records. I started listening to recordings and playing by ear. One of the first jazz records I ever listened to was a Dave Brubeck quartet record, and uh, it had a, he had a great saxophone player with him, a very melodic player named Paul Desmond. So I would listen to Paul Desmond, I would listen to Dave Brubeck, and play along with the records. That's how I started. It was a combination of classical and listening and learning to improvise by ear. As I kept practicing and kept studying, uh, I started listening to more and more recordings. And uh, for a Christmas gift uh, year, uh, when I was about 14 years old, my mother gave me a recording of uh, Miles Davis's Kind of Blue record. That was, that was my first jazz record. So when I heard that record, you know, it was such a great, great record. I listened to that a lot. And uh, on that record was Miles Davis, of course. There were two piano players, uh, Bill Evans and Wynton Kelly. Uh, the bass player was Paul Chambers. The uh, drummer was Jimmy Cobb. And the alto player was Cannonball Adderley, who was one of my favorite alto players. And the tenor player was John Coltrane. And when I heard John Coltrane, it just really affected me. It really touched me very deeply. I got very, very focused on his playing. And I started to just buy Coltrane uh, records and listen to Coltrane records all the time. What I did was I had, I had my record player, you know, we had records, 33s, you know, big records. And uh, I would take three or four Coltrane records and put them on my record player and play them very softly at night as I went to sleep. So I would listen, I would listen to Coltrane as I fell asleep every night on the, with the records. So training the subconscious mind. Right. So before I learned what chords were, and what scales were, chord scales were, I was playing some of the intervals and some of the melodic things that I heard Coltrane play from recordings. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the thing that affected me about his sound was it was very strong and very clear. He had a very clear sound and very clear technique. So with what I was doing classically, learning the etudes, learning how to play the instrument in tune, my technical ability helped me to understand what Coltrane was doing technically on the saxophone. So as I went through high school, I was playing classical music and also playing with jazz groups, playing with bands, playing with my friends, improvising by ear. When I graduated from high school, I won a scholarship to the Berklee School of Music in Boston. That's where I learned about the chord scales. I learned that there's a scale for every chord. And if you learn all the scales for all of the chords, it's impossible to play a wrong note. Then I began to learn the discipline about playing all the scales in all of the keys. Uh, when we improvise, basically we work from seven modes, seven modal scales. Number one is Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian. Seven. Ionian is a major scale. 
Dorian is the basic minor scale that all jazz players use. Phrygian is a minor scale that is like a Spanish minor scale. Lydian is a major scale with a flat five. It is also major, so you can play Ionian or you can play Lydian. You have two choices for major, right? Mixolydian, number five, is the dominant scale. It's a basic dominant scale for all jazz playing, okay? Aeolian is a minor scale, the natural minor scale, and Locrian, number seven, is an altered scale. It's like a, it's like a minor seven flat five scale. That's the way they work, okay? Those are the seven scales. Now, I'll, I'll make an example for you, okay? Um, we'll, we'll play a little example. Let's take C minor. No C. Okay? When we learn to play minor, when we learn to play on the minors, I told you the first was Ionian, which was major. The second is Dorian, which is minor. So on the minor, on C minor, we're going to play the C Dorian scale. Now you find out what that is by saying C is the second degree of what major scale. If we're going to play in C minor, we play the C Dorian scale, okay? So all of our seven modes, we have Ionian, which is the major scale, Dorian, which is minor, okay? It's number two, mm -hmm. the number two scale, right? So if you're going to play in C minor, you say to yourself, C is the second note of, of what major, major scale? B flat major. Right. So C is the second degree of the B flat major scale. So if you're going to play in C minor, you play the B flat major scale starting on C. And that gives you the C minor scale. So let's play the chord. <laughs> C minor. That's the basic chord, right? just play the chord, you only have four notes to choose from, right? So this is a C minor chord. Four notes. So it always, it sounds like people used to play Dixieland. When you play the scale, when you play the Dorian scale, instead of having four notes, you have eight notes. So it opens up your melodic concept of playing. Instead of playing vertically up and down, you play horizontally across. So you have more notes to choose. So now the chord. <laughs> Then the scale. C minor again. Mm -hmm. 
the Dorian scale. I'm just mixing it up, right? Instead of going, I'm going, same notes, right? Just mixed up. Then, what I did was I learned one rule, right? The Dorian scale. I learned what that was first. Then I learned it chromatically, right? So everything you play in one key, you try to play in the next key so that you can play in all the keys on your instrument and there's no problem. So I created melodic, melodic patterns for myself to practice. So I would play a phrase. I'll tell you. Everything I play, I try to play in all the keys. It's a discipline. It's every day a discipline. It's like uh, continually training for the Olympics. That's what I basically do with everything. I practice, uh, I try to practice two hours every day, two or three hours a day. I have a basic workout that I do every day. It's like going to the gym. Uh, I do my warm ups for an hour. I practice, uh, I practice classical etudes for half an hour, and then I play with a Jamie Abersall record for half an hour. That's my two hours. So we'll play a tune, and then I'll show you some of my, some of my warm-ups, some of my practice uh, systems. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Uh, всех ладов. Но один очень важный для меня вопрос. Удивительный звук саксофона ни на кого не похожий. И это очень важная часть вообще искусства любого инструменталиста. Что в этом плане предпринимает Эрни Лотс и как это было вот, по поводу работы над звуком? Потому что неповторимый звук саксофона. Well, much, 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 much John Coltrane. So that focused my sound, you know. You know, the, I, I focused on having a clear sound. That was from listening to Coltrane. My sound quality evolved from really playing pop music. Because when you play pop music, you can't do anything. When you play pop music, you cannot do anything harmonically. You cannot do anything inventive. You cannot do anything that is spontaneous. So it, it's, a, it's a formula, mm -hmm. right? So if you can't do anything, you know, if you can't do anything harmonically, if you can't do anything that is different 
from the pattern, then you focus on your sound quality. If you can only play, if you can only play <coughs> one note, mm -hmm. then one note has to count. Yeah. One note has to have much meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Мистер Олдс говорил, что он много занимался классической музыкой, много играл классики на саксофоне. Возможно ли, что такой вот особый мелодизм в его джазовых импровизациях происходит именно от этого, от его больших и там долгих занятий классической музыкой? affects what we do. So studying classical music, playing in orchestras, reading, sight reading, uh, all of the experiences that we have in classical music give us the discipline to play clearly and play fluidly when we improvise mm -hmm. because you learn how to play when you study classical music and you study the classical repertoire you learn how to play your instrument and you learn how to play your instrument right you learn how to play in tune you learn what the notes are you learn how to read music then you take that discipline and that skill and you apply it to the things that are in your heart. And from the discipline and from the learning to be clear on your instrument, then you can be clear in your songs, in, expression. in, in your expression, right. И другая сторона вопроса, что он думает о различии во фразировке джазовой и академической вот классической, поскольку это все-таки абсолютно разная как, вот, школа исполнения на саксофоне. Well, you know, I think all of it comes together. I think we learn about phrasing from classical music, and then you and 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 then you find someone like George Gershwin. Now, was George was George Gershwin a jazz composer? Or was George Gershwin a classical composer? Because George Gershwin got mm -hmm. motifs mm -hmm. and music from blues mm -hmm. and streets and everywhere. Mm -hmm. But he made it into a 20th century classical piece, I guess, you know. But that's a question, right? Who was what did what was George Gershwin? Uh those kind of things because music comes together sometimes like that. Oh, I think it all I think it all works together. Uh, the more experiences we have, the more we have to share. Well conceptually philosophically Classical music is an interpretive form of music. Beethoven wrote his notes, Stravinsky wrote his notes, the great composers wrote all of their notes on a piece of paper, and it took them years, some of them. And our responsibility as musicians when we play their music is to play their music as authentically as possible. So what we do is they create that music, we interpret that music. You don't take Le Sucre de, de Printemps and play a jazz solo in it, you know, in the beginning. You don't go. Or they'll throw you out of the orchestra. You have to have your own orchestra. Okay? With jazz, 
Jazz is creative. We create that music. There's a song, we play the song, and then we improvise, and that's our creation. We experiment with the scales, we experiment with sounds, and think of things melodically, making melodies, you know. If you play a scale, then you know the notes that are in the scale, you know the letters in the word, then you mix them up to make other words, okay? That you do with your mind. Music is very, very, very deep. Uh, music is energy. Everything is energy. Everything is a velocity of energy. So, when you listen and you relate to other things, other sounds, sound to sound, you're working with energy. And so, after you've played for years and years and years, I've been playing the saxophone for 53 years, right? So after you play the saxophone all of your life, at a certain point, the music plays itself, you know? The music comes through you, and when you hear something and you react, you're reacting in, the, in a natural way because you don't think about this. You don't think about this machine, you know? If somebody says to you, hey, and it's somebody you know, they say, hey, then you say, oh, hey, you know? And that's the same way with playing music. The piano player goes, hey, ba -da -ba -da, and then you go, oh, hey, ba -da -ba -da, right? And you create something together and you have a conversation, right? What we, what we strive for is total freedom to be totally free to play whatever you feel on your instrument, but enable in, to be totally free, you have to spend time with the discipline, right? Playing any instrument, whatever style of music, whatever you want to play, it is still deriving freedom through discipline. With me, learning to play, I grew up listening to John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, Eric Dolphy, Miles Davis, Oscar Peterson, Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins, Dizzy Gillespie. All of these people are the people that I listen to all the time. So the saxophone players that I listen to all the time were Coltrane, Eric Dolphy, Cannonball Adderley, people like this. So when I was a child, when I was 13 or 14, that's all I listened to. So that's what I thought that the sound was supposed to be. That's what I thought that the, that's what that's how I thought you played jazz. I wanted to play jazz, so I learned to play like those guys. And then I was 22 years old before I found out that they were some of the most highly advanced, evolved musicians that ever lived. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was just a kid. I was, just, I was learning to play by ear what they were playing, mm -hmm. and they were great, and I just figured everybody played that way. So it's a big thing about the things you listen to. The things you listen to and the things that you let into your life create your life. So if you want to be great, you have to listen to great people. You have to listen to great music. And then what happens is it gets inside of you. It becomes a part of you. If all you listen to is great music, 
how can you play something stupid? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That is very important. You know, people take care of their health, they go to school, they watch their diet, and then they let anything into their mind. They let anything into their head. And that's where everything begins. Everything begins with your mind. It's all about what we think. And if you love music and you really want to play, then you focus on that. And, and it happens. It takes time. It's a discipline. But if you love what you do, the discipline is your joy. You know, if you love to play, then it should be easy to practice two or three hours a day because you love what you do. There's two, two steps, right? Number one is practice. And you practice, and you practice, and you practice every day, forever, for the rest of your life, you practice. Number two is when you go to perform, when you go to play, you forget everything you practice. <laughs> you don't practice on the stage. You practice at home. You come to play at night. And you open yourself up to the music. And you relate to the sounds that you hear. When I play, I hear something, and I play something. And it's always a relationship like that. I'm not saying to myself, OK, I'm going to play this diminished pattern here. Or I'm going to play this chromatic pattern here. Um, it's like a conversation. When you talk to someone, you don't think about where you're going to put your tongue to say the, or duh, or day. If you had to think about all of the things you had to do to make a word, you could not talk. If you had to think about all the things that it takes to make a word, you could not talk because you'd be spending all your time thinking. When you play music, if you spend all of your time thinking about what you're going to play, you can't play. All you can do is think. And so you stand there and you go, And then the song is over. <laughs> and you go home. Well, it's all incorporated. It's all incorporated with arpeggios major, minor, augmented, and diminished arpeggios. Then all extensions uh, with the altissimo. Mm -hmm. Because I play a lot up high, I work on that. So that's a part of my playing. So I have an exercise for that. I play a minor 11th chord then up an octave. Right? And I do that chromatically an octave.
so all of these things I do to have freedom on my instrument so that I can play anything that I hear simultaneously, right? The philosophy, my philosophy of playing jazz is improvisation is spontaneous composition. Okay? Therefore, in order to compose spontaneously, you have to be able to have the freedom of your vocabulary. This is a machine, right? This is like you, you talk through this. This is what we sing through. So in order to sing and in order to play, we have to be totally natural on the instrument so that we can play anything we think of immediately. That's about the most difficult thing that there is, you know. Tchaikovsky, he wrote out all his music. Stravinsky, he wrote out all his music. Beethoven, he wrote out all his music. When we play, it's now. Totally different. Very difficult. So you really have to focus. You really have to know your instrument, you know. Because that's what we do. We, we compose spontaneously. We sing through our instrument. So the way you play your instrument, what you know about chords, what you know about scales, that's your vocabulary. Those are your words. That's how you sing. If you have a small vocabulary, you can only communicate on a very small level. The bigger your vocabulary is, the more you can communicate. We all get the same information. Mm -hmm. You know, like we said, uh, C minor seven is C minor seven to me, it's C minor seven to Keith Jarrett, it's C minor seven to Bach, it's C minor 7 to Beethoven. It's the same notes, right? C minor is C minor. How we think about it and how we put it together is related to other things in our life and our environment. You know, everything we do in our life contributes to our music. Everything that we are is, 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 is projected through our music. So every night when I play, it's related to things that happen today. You know, like tonight when I play, it, it's related to meeting you and talking with you and thinking about things that we talk about. Скажите, пожалуйста, когда вы практикуетесь, э, ну, гаммы или еще что-то, вот когда вы играете, э, есть, э, вы думаете о сильных и слабых долях, э, попадают ли аккордовые звуки на эти э, сильные и слабые доли, или просто, как говорится, куда Бог на душу положит? When I think, I don't think about beats. I think about melody. And wherever it comes, it comes. You know, let's play some in uh, F7. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> just thinking melodically. Now, psychologically, Western music is written in four bar phrases if it's medium or slow, eight bar phrases if it's fast. 
That's how Western music works. That's how popular music works. So we have been psychologically trained as human beings to hear music in four bar phrases and eight bar phrases. This has to do with your question about meters and that kind of thing. Okay, so now here's a puzzle, here's a test. Four bar phrases are what people hear. The first three bars I can play anything I want as long as I resolve on the fourth bar. What I call that is validating the Western ear. It's like, it's like being a tightrope walker. It's like being a circus walker. And you go out on the line and you go, whoa, whoa. And all the people are going, whoa, whoa. And then he gets to the end and he goes, Ta-da! And then everybody says, yay! You know? And he's done that 500,000 times. Right? But the people, they think he's going to fall. That creates excitement. Right? We do that with our music. You're just manipulating people. Excuse me? <laughs> what? You're, you're manipulating people. I'm playing with them. I play with people. Right. <laughs> I play with all of you. That's why you come to see me. Because I make you feel good. I make you feel good because I bring you joy. I bring you joy because I play with you. I play with your ears and I play with your mind. I stimulate you. That's why you're here. So we're going to play F7 I'm going to play anything I want and resolve on the fourth bar. And it will sound like Ornette Coleman, but it'll be okay. <laughs> So do that while I play, and you'll hear how it go, how the phrasing goes. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> There's a thousand, thousand, thousand things to talk about. I think the most important thing to remember is freedom through discipline. The more you study, and the more you listen, and the more you practice, the easier it will be for you to play your instrument. 